dollars. Live from the studios of NBC 12 and ABC 25, this is First Coast News at 6. Fire, fire, fire. Fire, I hear it. My, my apartment, bro. Fire. Oh, you, your apartment's on fire? Yes. Right now at 6, we've learned that the senior living high rise that caught fire on the south side this morning felt a routine inspection just a couple of months ago. And tonight, some residents claim the fire alarm never went off when an eighth floor apartment went up in flames. Tonight, 100 people are displaced. And just moments ago, we got this video into our newsroom from inside the apartment as firefighters race to evacuate everyone inside. Our Juliet Dreyer is live at Faith United Methodist Church, where many people will have to spend the night. Juliet. Anthony, the Red Cross set up this shelter here for the dozens of people who still can't go home tonight. And this is where they will be spending the night. The Red Cross says 116 people right now are receiving help from the shelter, and they were just told to expect to house them until Thursday. Meanwhile, we've uncovered documents that show that the Jacksonville townhouse apartments actually failed a fire inspection earlier this year. According to the JFRD inspection reports, the building's fire pump and or sprinkler systems were not working during an October 24th routine fire inspection. Then on December 1st, Division Chief and Fire Marshal Kevin Jones sent an email to Washington State based Cambridge Management Incorporated, which manages the Jacksonville townhouse apartments and that that email says as a result, the apartment complex must institute a so-called fire watch or evacuate the building until the equipment is working again. Now, a fire watch is a person who walks the property over set intervals of time 24 seven to make sure there's no sign of fire or smoke. The person must be specially trained in fire prevention and protection. A JFRD says the sprinkler systems did work during the early morning fire, but residents tell me the fire alarms never sounded. In the last 10 years, it's probably gone off 30 times. I mean, now when it's real, it didn't go off. I don't understand. Now, just about an hour ago, we did hear back from the property manager, Cambridge Management Incorporated, and they said they are conducting an internal investigation, but it's their management's belief that the fire sprinklers and fire alarms did work as intended. Meanwhile, the state fire marshal is investigating, but they say at this point the fire appears accidental. There's no sound, of, no sign, excuse me, of foul play or suspicious activity. Reporting live on the South Side, Juliet Dreyer, First Coast News on your side. In Putnam County, no arrests have been made so far after a suspicious fire that severely burned an eight-year-old girl. And earlier today, police in Palatka announced the girl found inside that burning home Friday has died. Officers say she was home alone when it caught fire, and the fire marshal is investigating it as suspicious. The name of the child has not been released, and if this case turns out to be arson, the fire marshal will offer a reward for information. If an appeals court does not rule in her favor, Kareen Brown will have to report to federal prison in early 2018. And for the first time tonight, we're seeing the flood of letters the public sent to the trial judge before he decided on her sentence. First Coast News reporter Julia Janae is live in the Information Center with what these letters had to say. Julia. Sorry, Anthony, there are over a hundred letters. Most of them ask the judge to give Congresswoman Brown the lightest sentence possible, but the others demand that she go to jail. At the sentencing pronouncement earlier this month, Judge Tim Corgan told the court that he read each and every letter while he was making his decision. They are from people across the country, pastors and gospel artists, students, and ranging in people from age 8 to 80. Now, one three-page letter from Chantrell Brown. Uh, Brown's daughter talks about how painful it has been to see her mother's legacy ruined through these proceedings. It also asks the judge to consider the congresswoman's 90 year old mother, who she says is in ailing health and relies on Corrine Brown for care. There are also those from students who are taking on a trip to China for free by the congresswoman and one from a resident urges the judge to give Brown years of prison time. That resident said Brown failed to help his wife get a green card years ago. Now these letters were not part of the court record and they're typically not made public, but they were released in response to a request from First Coast News and other local media outlets. They are now online on our website at firstcoastnews.com. For now, reporting from the Information Center, Julia Janae, First Coast News on your side.
Thanks, Julia. The Neptune Beach teenager accused of killing his own grandmother says he is innocent and he is pleading not guilty. 15-year-old Logan Mott was back in court today. Police say Mott stabbed and shot Christina French to death and then buried her body in the family's backyard. Mott was arrested in New York trying to cross into Canada. He is being charged with second degree murder, but maintains his innocence. Tonight, people on the first coast are still trying to recover from the damage left by Hurricane Irma. But a West Jacksonville property owner is now threatening to sue the city over storm damage. A tree in the city easement fell on his property, causing damage, and all he wants the city to do is remove the tree, but it's still there. Ken Amaro is on your side tonight looking into his complaint. That's correct, Anthony. It seems like a simple issue that is now clouded by property line markers. But what we saw today should make it clear as to who owns the property where the tree fell. But unfortunately, it does not clearly define who is liable, and that tonight is part of the problem. It goes all the way down the property and all. In 2016, Leon Janja became the owner of this property on Chafee Road. We're going through the motions with the city right now to get this thing done. Now he's in a dispute over property line and city liability. What's really true is the property line when everything's clear. This yellow survey marker shows his property line is before the wooden fence and six to eight feet from an easement, a public right of way. Everything beyond the, behind this fence is not mine. And that's where his dispute lies with the city, a dispute created in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. J.A. Cruz maintained this side of the easement, as you can see from a recent cut on that tree right there. And the argument is that that tree that flipped over is sitting right in the city's easement. It flipped and landed on John Jock's wooden fence and in his yard. Now he wants the city to remove the tree. I can't get any help anybody. They want to just pass the buck, if you will. He says he doesn't want to file a claim. He doesn't want to file a lawsuit. We have options that we can do here. John Jock says all he wants is for the city of Jacksonville to do what is right. We just want the city to come out and remove the tree. We will take care of the fence. Accept responsibility and clean up the mess. But he says so far, no one is responding. Everybody's just gave me a, a closed door everywhere I went. Now we've been asking questions, so JEA is now reviewing its role in this dispute. We know that the city has an active care issue on file. A spokesperson told me that COJ is now investigating to determine its next step. The overall issue involves the power lines, the property lines, and the storm's aftermath. Of course, I'll follow up to see what the city determines in the next few days. Back to you. Ken, thank you. Well, flights in and out of Jacksonville are returning to normal tonight after a massive power outage in Atlanta sparked delays nationwide. We're told thousands of passengers were trapped on tarmacs for hours, but right now there are much shorter lines and fewer delays at JIA. First Coast News spoke with a few passengers tonight. One man says his flight was canceled yesterday. Fortunately, he was traveling for the holidays and said he just wasn't in a hurry. Sort of. It was getting up here. There was some traffic. Um, we were actually worried about taking a later flight because there was so much traffic on the roads, but um, we were able to get through. I'm not sure because I haven't checked security yet, but I think it'll be okay. Yeah, she's not bad off either, huh? Again, no major delays or cancellations today, but if you are flying out, officials are still recommending that you arrive at least three hours before your flight, especially if you are checking a bag. A St. John's County Marina is still in shambles tonight, three months after Hurricane Irma. The reason you may have to wait until next summer to use it again. Plus, it's been 10 long years since the Jaguars' last playoff game, but that drought is over. Yay, coming up, we're going to hear lots of details coming up in sports. And there's a strong cold front near the North Pole. Where will it be on Christmas Eve? We'll check it out. Well, many docks and marinas took a hit when Hurricane Irma came through. One marina still struggling is the St. Augustine Municipal Arena. Revenue is down by half and it will be a while before it's fully back up and running. Our Jessica Clark has a look at what's happening this week. Yeah, and you can see that, that the dock right down here is being held together with boards and cables. Sam Adukowitz is the harbor master at the St. Augustine Municipal right. Marina. The marina is still in shambles after Hurricane Irma came through in September. The morning after the hurricane, it was like coming down here to identify a friend's body. 
you know, it was sad. Of the 100 boat slips here, about 60 are now out of commission. Even the ones that look usable are not. Are not because of the Structural damage. They have structural damage and, and there's no electrical. Some of the boat slips do have electricity, but it comes from big cables that have to be run along the dock for right now. Three months after the storm, the diesel pumps are up and running. The gas pumps, well, new equipment just came in for these today, and the gas pump should be up and running by the end of the week. This is a city owned marina. All of this lingering damage means fewer boats can dock and fuel up, so revenues are down by about half. We're normally doing about $80,000 to $85,000 a month this time of year, and in November we were at $45,000. So okay. that's right around 50%. Once we heard that they were up and running, at least in a limited capacity, we decided to come on up. Andy Booth came in his yacht from Palm Coast. I've been here many times and it's in bad shape. Three to 5,000 regional customers like Booth, as well as transient boaters from up north, typically dock at the St. Augustine Municipal Marina each year, and the city is losing half of them now. Hurricane Irma came from the southeast, which was our Achilles heel. Request for construction bids went out Monday. Adugawit says repairs will cost at least $2 million and they may not be completed until the summer, depending on how busy contractors are. Sure. What other marinas they're working on? There's marinas that are destroyed all up and down the east coast of Florida right now. Adugowitz thinks of this marina as an old friend who has been through some troubled waters. But uh, we'll get through it and we'll, it'll, we'll make it better than it's ever been. In St. Augustine, Jessica Clark, First Coast News on your side. Thank you, Jess. Tonight, the future of CSX remains unclear after the sudden death of CEO Hunter Harrison. The company's stock fell nearly 10% following the news that Harrison was on medical leave last week. First Coast News reporter Nick Perot explains what's next for the company. Cost relative to revenue. This was CEO Hunter Harrison before the Surface Transportation Board back in October of this year. But even before CSX announced Harrison was on medical leave for health reasons, the board questioned the company's progress. Thursday, the board sent this letter to CSX asking for a progress report of the new operating system following continued complaints of service challenges, inadequate service, and lack of communication with changes to service to rail shippers. CSX says they are aware of the criticisms inside this letter and say they are working on addressing those in a response but that has yet to be published. CSX says they remain committed to reducing transit times and say they've already seen success from implementing Mr. Harrison's vision and have remained focused on executing his plans. I work with a lot of clients in the short line industry, short line railroads that connect with CSX. Um, several of them were having significant challenges a few months ago. And Josh Putterman keeps track of how much companies ship and where they ship. He says, yes, a few months back, some deliveries were several days behind, especially in the southeast, but things are improving. Is it perfect? And is it, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, is everything fine? Not yet, but most definitely improved. Putterman is also a former 16-year CSX employee and says he remains confident in the direction CSX is headed. The fact that they've been able to overcome the dramatic drop in coal and still be as profitable as they are now sort of tells you what kind of a, you know, just earning power the company has. Certainly turned the corner and now it's a matter of implementation and consistent execution. CSX has yet to decide if the current interim CEO, Jim Foote, will remain CEO will become full-time CEO, but say the company will continue to implement the vision put forth by Hunter Harrison. In Jacksonville Beach, Nick Perot, First Coast News, on your side. Now, weather with your First Coast News storm experts. Can you guys believe a week from today? Christmas? It's Christmas. Christmas. It's beginning <laughs> to feel, feel like a it. lot like <laughs> Maybe not. Christmas. Maybe not. Yeah. Well, it's 81 degrees, or was 81 degrees, and when it's that warm, sometimes that means with moisture, Thunderstorms? Yeah. Can it be? Yeah, let's take a look. We actually had some lightning and some thunder. When I say we, the first coast includes folks out toward the Suwannee and out northwest of the Osceola and northwest of the Okefenokee. And there were some thunderstorms that made it to the Suwannee. And there are some thunderstorms now over the northern parts of the uh, Okefenokee. And even for those of us in the Jacksonville metropolitan area, the clouds did thicken as we went through the afternoon. There's some sprinkles. I want to emphasize that. Just sprinkles, I think, primarily along I-10 and then Atlantic Boulevard southward. As far as any type of downpours left, here they are. For those of you, they've already passed through Waycross, but you'll still be dealing with them in other areas uh, through northern Ware, extreme southern 
uh, Pierce County and then into Brantley County. And then some of these showers will also they'll be heavy enough to maybe produce a few puddles, get the windshield wipers going, especially over northern Camden County and then through Glen County. So probably the largest population center left will be for those of you around Brunswick to St. Simons Island. That'll be within about the next hour. And then that should be it as far as the showers, but it's going to leave some moisture around. Uh, we have temperatures near the dew point. So what? Uh, well, with temperatures near the dew point, that means relative humidity levels are already high. With the dew point near the sea surface temperatures, that means clouds can form right on the sea. We call that sea fog. And all of those are reasons why during the morning, both over land, on the beaches, and offshore, there will be some fog during the morning. However, it will gradually lift. And look at this, even the beaches with a west wind. So despite that chilly Sea surface temperature, although it has moderated back up to 16 degrees Celsius, that land temperatures will make it to 80. Uh, again, we have a new moon overnight tonight through tomorrow. There will be some sea fog. Now, as long as there's a light westerly breeze, that keeps most of the sea fog over the sea. Uh, but if we get an easterly breeze, especially as we head toward Tuesday night and Wednesday, some of that sea fog could roll in. And the reason I'm emphasizing the sea fog is that can make for especially dense and long lasting fog. But even over land, the fog will start off with it. Then the temperatures will warm once again to near record levels. We missed the record today by just two degrees. So what about that front that is near? Well, Santa, the North Pole, it's headed south. There will be a weak front that will impact us on Thursday, but there's the major front. By Thursday, from Chicago to Dallas, it's going to drive to the southeast and on Christmas Eve, make it to Atlanta, and then it's going to slow down, but eventually it will make it to the first coast. I'll wrap it up and get out of the way to show you that that polar front probably knocking on our door late Christmas Eve. And they're going to always be... <laughs> the Jacksonville Jaguars picked their 10th win on Sunday, and folks, we're headed to the postseason. And the First Coast Sports team has jumped aboard. Fantastic functions for a party, y'all. A party on a party bus. It's Thursday night, 7.30, ABC 25. Be there or be square. From the Farrah and Farrah Sports Desk, it's First Coast Sports. Good thing about this team, all you guys have done is you've enjoyed the win, enjoyed each other, and then you came back to work and just focused on winning the next game. That's all we have to do. <laughs> but we said our goal was to run the division. Right, girl. We just dominated a team yeah. that done dominated us a couple years. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. New wave. We understand yeah. what you're talking about. New wave. Yeah. Big wave. New era. Yeah. Yeah. I love y'all boys, man. Yeah. And let's keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Three. One, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Victory Monday here on our first coast, and the Jaguars have given their fans an early Christmas present. The Big Cats locked up a spot in the playoffs for the first time in a decade. A big reason for that, the play of their quarterback, Blake Bortles. Bortles is having a December to remember. He's thrown for 903 yards, seven touchdowns, and has not thrown not one interception. But the numbers get even better. Bortles has the highest passer rating of any NFL quarterback this month, and most importantly, Jeannie Blaylock, our Jags are three and zero. Yeah, you know I think it's awesome. Um, you know, obviously growing up, you know, you heard about Brunel and Fred Taylor and Jimmy Smith and Baselli and Keenan and all those guys, um, and then there was just kind of like a long absence of anything, you know. And, and and I was a part of that for the past three years of kind of not really playing good ball, and um, you know to be able to turn that around, uh, you know, I think what Doug's done has been awesome. And, and you know, like you said, be a part of of the team that you know is changing the culture. Um, it, it's tough to put into words. It's special. Uh, unbelievably proud to be a part of this group and play for this organization. And we're happy for Blake. After yesterday's game, team owner Shot Khan addressed media about the team's recent success. He said that so far this season, it's been incredible. But Khan was also asked about the last several years when the Jags have been the laughing stock of the NFL. Well, I mean, I've been through life when I was a laughing stock in whatever, whatever business I was in, auto parts or what have you. And then you have to stay with it and uh, success comes. It's a story of perseverance. An update on Jags receiver Marquise Lee, who left yesterday's game with an ankle injury. A report from the uh, NFL Network's Ian Rapp report today said the team received good news on Lee's MRI and that he should be back 
by the playoffs or sooner. Monday night quarterback, your opportunity to sound off all things Jacksonville Jaguars. We're winning, and I know you have nothing but great things to say about your team. Send me a rant to sports at firstcoastnews.com, and I'll show the best rants tonight at 11. Hashtag team sideline. And let me tell you, one of the biggest Jags fans is in this studio right now. His name is Timmy B. And Timmy B, our sports producer, was popping bottles for the playoffs. Don't be ashamed. Timmy B showing his team pride on Twitter using the hashtag Team Sideline. Speaking of a party, we got one for you Thursday night, 7.30 on ABC 25. We're back after this timeout.